Hello, folks. Uh, thanks for joining my session. Thanks for being here. My name is Dio Rattori. I work for JP Morgan Chase. Um, I work within the uh, Asset and Wealth Management Business Unit, and my responsibility is to help and assist teams uh, take applications to both public and private cloud every day. And my challenge that I have every day is the challenge of scale. Right. So it's not the challenge of moving one application to the cloud. Uh, it's not the challenge of helping a single team but it's a challenge of doing this with hundreds of applications, thousands of developers that are distributed across the globe, right? So very lucky to be uh, to work with a very um, um, capable team, uh, very also technically savvy team and uh, organizationally well-defined um, well team uh, that uh, we do this every day. So again, my challenge is scale here. Let's touch a little bit on scale, right? So they said JP Morgan has four main business units. Asset and wealth management is one of them. And um, uh, scale is a problem because we deal with um, let's say assets and essentially money from a lot of people, right? And, and companies. So we have around $2.8 trillion uh, in assets man under management. That is like some, some, some company's money or some human's money, right? If we're talking about private bank, that we have to be very respectful, uh, continue to um, uh, make their investments worthy so that they continue to be incentivized to work with us, right? Um, because of that, uh, the nature is that we are uh, globally distributed. So we run um, our businesses in various countries, right, across the globe, right? Um, and we haven't just started now, right, this journey to cloud, right? So as a firm and within AWM, we have already uh, 35,000 containers running uh, uh, applications across dev, test, and prod, right? Uh, both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So teams, they sort of know what, let's say, a cloud native environment looks like. So they understand the benefits of it, right? Um, there's still, of course, a lot of, 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 of software that does not run on, 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 on those environments. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? The fact that something is not running in a cloud native environment uh, doesn't, doesn't mean that it's bad software, right? It doesn't mean that it was like poorly written or, or poorly maintained. No, there's actually like a lot of very, very good software that runs important parts of the businesses that you can't necessarily badge them as cloud native, but they're like well written, well maintained, well thought through, well architected software, right? So it's it's just a uh, it's 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 a healthy thing to not label things that are not cloud native uh, as necessarily uh, to not label them as bad, right? So you need to be very wise and understand what's going on. So by the nature of what we do as well, and being a large firm, we have software from from everywhere, right? So I joke that we have a little bit, at least one of everything, right? Uh, that means that through time and through our existence, we have acquired many vendor softwares. We have built ours. We have used different types of databases, different types of application servers. Um, and we also use a lot of SaaS services, right? We integrate with a lot of companies. So it, it's fair to say that the ecosystem is complex, not purely from, let's say, number of applications, but like the uh, geographically distributed nature of make it comp complex, the governance aspects that apply to each region makes it complex the of course the scale uh, in terms of like number of instances that we have of things make, makes it complex right so it's like it's a scale from various angles right um and 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 if i again put my hat and this is deal like hey i'm i am head of like the cloud program for awm like what does it mean to me and there's a few things that i always have to consider right one is that in general terms right this is not like very specific, like in general terms, um, an IT organization exists or the main goal is to be very respectful with the data that you have at hand. Like literally, yes, security first, right? So the force that you have should have that mindset, a mindset of security first, right? And as a, as of course, the business end of that is that an IT organization exists to enable business to do better through technology, right? So that's why we as information technology exist. So, so if you take that angle, right, of the, of the basic things, right, a business or let's say our internal client does not come to us necessarily asking us to build a resilient application or to build a resilient platform, right? It does not necessarily ask us to migrate from X to Y. It does not actually ask us to secure data, right? So business and internal clients, they are asking app teams to develop function or capabilities in their applications that will serve their customers better, right? And those things here, is it resilient? Uh, is it... Um, 
uh, are you able to uh, to migrate this application to a new environment or can it scale or is it secure? It's sort of given, right? And that's an important point is that the priorities that the internal clients and business that are putting in application teams do not necessarily immediately equate to let's migrate to cloud, right? So with that, I want to bring you my first point of this is that I have learned that it's, it's better if application teams want to move than if they feel that they have to, right? I think ultimately some corporate program will kick in that will treat applications that are not on modern platforms or classified as such, uh, and, and will treat them in a way that they are sort of like, let's say, quote unquote, forced, right? But I'm, I can't wait for that moment to happen, right? I need that to happen now. So my stance is I need to create incentives so that folks feel that they should want to move to cloud environments, right? And in terms of incentives, uh, we need to touch on the fact that teams are already with at air capacity, right? I, I don't think I can find one team or many teams that are just sitting there with 20% of their time available and it can just bring more work to them, like, like randomly bring more work to them. So they have to sort of want because they need to then negotiate that time with their business sponsors, right? And make it, make it understood. Like the fact that it is a strategic decision for a company facilitates that conversation, but that negotiating negotiation of that time still has to be there. So for us, we have learned a few things, right? So we've learning, we've uh, running the cloud option program for some time now, right? Uh, it's fair to say that it started the, the public, public cloud program with more strong wins in 2019. And we noticed a few things on the first teams that had to go there. So the first teams that had to go there, they had to have some new capability implemented for them, or they actually had to help test the new capability, right? Um, maybe a service that they wanted to use wasn't there or like the instructions were not completely there, right? The instructions were not necessarily there. So they also have had to have built instructions, right? And if you look at like, what does it mean? Those people are what we call traditionally in the market, right? Uh, innovators and early adopters, right? Because, hey, it's someone that's willing to use technology because that person likes technology. It's willing to take the risk of, of newer technology, right? due to the potential gains and scalable gains that new technology could have if you adopt it before others. But that person has to be willing to invest the time to build the product. And it's good that we have identified this because the advantage of identifying a group is that it sort of leads you into like, hey, what are the other groups then, right? And for us, interestingly enough, our share of the folks that were taking applications to production in public cloud, the first ones, right? In this, let's say the first phase of our program, it was like almost very much matching the technology lifecycle adoption curve. So 12 to 18% of the app teams of the humans were the ones taking 80% of the workloads to production. That's just a great point because it, it brings me the automatic uh, thought, like what do I do next? Because it's great to have them, but I need the other, the other uh, uh, folks to go as well, right? So the point is like, what is acceptable for uh, early adopters? It's not acceptable for the mainstream market, right? Um, and the mainstream market is like very much risk prone, right? So we need to address to the mainstream market, um, you need to reduce the perception that the product is not ready, right? And they also need much, much more peer validation. So we've learned that in order to cross the barrier from like early adopters and innovators that like technology, that are willing to take the time to the uh, mainstream market. Again, like this is mainstream market in a firm uh, like JP Morgan, where we're respectful with a lot of money from our customers, right? Um, so risk factor is very much there, you know, like, is it worth the change? Is it worth the risk? So that, those are like everyday, everyday conversations, you know? And, and, and the program, what we bring to the program is like, I want to reduce your level of uncertainty so that you're willing to follow on this journey for us. And now a little bit of my background. So like, this is my first time working in an enterprise company. Before this, I worked as product marketing and management for various companies. So my background is product marketing and product management. And like, when I saw this, like, I don't think I necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, right? Because when I look at the scale of our organization, 
it feels like we're much very like our own industry, you know? So that like, I also, I sort of could employ the same techniques that the software industry or technology industry applies to crossing that barrier. I could apply inside because my scale is large enough to justify that. So in my mind, there's like, what lessons did I learn uh, by working in product marketing management industry that I can bring to my work today, you know? And that is how we design and build the cloud adoption program. Let's get into like very actionable things. Uh, one is I understood, and most software companies understand that they can't scale their business if, if all the adoption relies on purely themselves, right? So in order for us to scale our adoption program, we implemented a few things, right? We implemented a group of, of, of folks that we called cloud champions. And I've seen the champion model before, right? In a pre previous uh, stint in another company, uh, the vendor would pay a champion to be sitting at another vendor just to advocate for that brand, right? So this is what we have. So we have, uh, starting with the folks of the early adopters innovators that are there, they are not necessarily as even distributed, but we also found folks that were interested in, in and wanted to join. So we're able to form a group of people across our major application groups, right? So again, it's like uh, roughly 600 applications. There's various application groups. So we found that group of people say, hey, let's build them so that they can scale us, right? And it's good. So like, what, what do you equate this to? You could equate them to like evangelists, right? You could create folks that like startup meetups and they do not work for the software company that created that, that, that software for, for the meetup, right? Um, so, and that's, that's what we want with them. The, there's a few caveats, right? So one, they are vocal and loud and you want that, but they will be loud about the good and the bad, but it's not necessarily like in the end, the natural result is that it is positive because they will duly represent their needs and asks and their app group. Uh, but they also be your partners in this. So, so focusing on building this group of champions is something that will benefit you a lot. Now, good. So this is like, okay, so I think we're getting there into how to scale our org because I cannot scale my org at the same rate that I need adoption to grow, right? So we did that. Um, the second thing is great. Now we need to deal with uncertainty as a practice. Right. So knowing that the mainstream market is much less risk prone, right? and again, the scale of the firm justifies treating almost like this is a software, traditional technology adoption lifecycle. Right? What do you do right, to reduce that risk? So we looked at the things that are not necessarily related to the product itself or like to moving to public cloud, but that are on the ecosystems of moving to the public cloud. So like, hey, would someone know immediately how to operate that application if moved to a public cloud environment? I say, hmm, it feels like the instructions are not there. And someone that is more response said, like, hey, I cannot operate, I'm not gonna go. I could migrate the application I have the technological capability to do it. I, could, I even have the time, but like, what do I do once I migrate? So we created a specific initiative to tackle day two, right? So like, what do you do once you're there? How do you operate? How do you perform backup? How do you perform restore? How do you perform an emergency management procedure? Like, how do you have access uh, to production uh, pieces under like, uh, under an incident, you know? Those are the things that are resolved uh, on-prem, but you need to build invent them, I would say almost, right, for a public cloud. Also data, key thing for us data, I think we were able to identify early on that the movement of data, either a one-off movement to migrate a database or the constant movement through a pipeline, that's also key, right? Um, there's a lot of governance aspects around data as well, probably worth an entire session on its own, right? Uh, but we focus like good. So we need to make folks comfortable about the movement of the data and about the pipelines to constantly move data there. So we built a practice on this. And by building a practice, it means that like we actually have um, a, a initiative that is seeing this problem, uh, treating it like a product, it's like, hey, what are the customers asking or what is it that they need? What capabilities could we implement, implement in terms of either technology or documentation or training uh, or just one-off hands-on assistance, right? So SDOC, it's sort of obvious, it needs to be there. SDLC or CSD will change uh, from what you have on prem to what you have on, on in cloud environments. And uh, maybe 
Uh, another important point is the one touch is how much we're investing in learning and enabled, right? I think uh, and we're finding that this is being very welcoming, right? Because when you enable folks to work in public cloud, they are building their careers, right? So you, they no longer have that feeling that the, the knowledge they are acquiring only applies to that specific thing at the firm, which could be sometimes the case, especially if your company built your own CI CD platform, your own dev tools, your own runtimes. That has happened, right? So, so all the knowledge that is learned taking applications to public cloud, that they, it, it's theirs, right? And they feel like, hey, the company is investing me in this. It's worth for me. I could stay in the company. I could move to another group. I could leave the company. That knowledge stays, right? So we're heavily incentivizing and paying for folks to, to, to take uh, AWS certifications, right? And all the other cloud provider certifications as well as, as like, hey, we want you to be better, right? Um, and in terms of scale, I think understanding how you integrate with, current systems, it's important. They touch a little bit, like no application is a silo today. It will always have to touch on something that already exists, right? Um, probably the, the one that helped move the needle, say the most in terms of the kickoff, right? Is what we call acceleration events, right? Uh, internally, we also have another name called cloud programs, right? But this is about uh, a highly focused engagement where you are able to bring to a room every single human in the firm that could make a decision about moving an application to a production environment. And I think every single individual is the key thing here. Like, this is not, this is not necessarily a cheap exercise, but it has worked for us a lot. So again, cloud, cloud going to public cloud has to be strategic for a company because otherwise it's hard for you to justify things like this. It's hard to, to justify flying a lot of people or dedicating time from a lot of people that already have a lot of work to do to a single place to invest like a couple of weeks of their time there. But for us, it has been amazing. We were able to move applications that were sitting on, I'm gonna call it legacy technology to public cloud in a matter of days because every single decision-making power was available. And the other mindset that happens on this acceleration events is a strong decision-making mindset because there are so many, so many decisions to be made that you will need to be fast at making the decisions. And in order to have less risk or reduce your amount of risk with being fast at making those decisions, you need the senior people there that have already built that knowledge, that know their complications and implications of making a fast decision. Still, you want to make those fast decisions. You will make through the course of the acceleration event, they're mostly like a week or two, you will make hundreds of decisions, right? Uh, but then you would have something working on it now. So at the end, so like, have this to yourself, you need to think about scale, you need to address uncertainty as a practice and exertion of it. Maybe the last one, we're a bank after all, so I should not forget this one, is that um, you need to track the dollars. Our experience has been that if, um, if, if this is a cosplay, and it's not necessarily a cosplay for all of us, but if this is a cosplay for you, hopefully it's a speed play, not a cosplay, um, that there will be a good amount of time where you're going to have your IT costs increased because you will be moving workloads to a new environment while you're not necessarily decommissioning on-prem or, or shutting down things elsewhere at the same rate, right? We, we, for this, we call it the bubble, right? In our case, it's fair to say that bubble is gonna stay with us for two years from the moment started until it ends. That's, that's sort of our projection, right? But then we should see uh, that not being a problem anymore, that the amount of decom will compensate for, 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 for that. And, and it happens, right? It happens because you are taking, like you're, you're teaching a team, you're taking an application to a production uh, workload, and that might run prod pr pillar for a while, team might need some more time to, to be comfortable. And so you are incurring the new costs and you're incurring the, call it like the, the old costs. So that's something that you'll be, you need to be very mindful of, right? Uh, wa watch for this. So budgeting for this moment of transition where you would probably have both costs, it's a very wise thing to do and I recommend you that. Um, I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna end, right? So uh, with a positive note, hopefully, that I, I, in order to move fast, right? application teams should want to move so that they can fight for the time of their business, right? You need to acknowledge the technology adoption life cycle as in that um, there are different people that need to consume different types of content and they are more or less risk prone and that should direct the decisions that you need to make when engaging them, right? Uh, crossing the barriers about dealing with uncertainty by design. So I, I manage a team that deals with uncertainty by design and that runs the program for for our LOB. 
Uh, it is a refreshing thing to do, but it's it's a heavy toll. It's constant switching, context switching all the time, right? Uh, and we are and we are tasked to dealing with uncertainty. Like we're we are the one that should bring peacefulness to a rather still uh, I'm going to call it a journey that still have a, a lot of paths to be paved. You know, not all the paths paths are paved. You know, um, and if if this is a cosplay for you, I'm going to say be mindful that for a while. Uh, you might have a little bit more costs. Again, hopefully this is a speed play. It should be more of a speed play than a cost play for, for, for companies, right? Um, and um, thank you very much for your time. I just uh, need to do the obligatory we're hiring and I'll be happy to participate with you uh, with questions and comments as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joy, for, for this very good overview what scale means to bring things to the cloud. Like it's Thanks. a different scale. <laughs> yeah, much much appreciated. Uh, and, and that's the message that I wanted to give to folks is that like dealing with scale of program like this, the technical aspect, it's it's an important, but it's a small part. When you're actually doing is like you're driving your organizational change, right? Um, so the technical aspect is there because of that's the design of what we do. You know, we exist to facilitate application teams to get from one place to another. Um, but our challenges are not necessarily technical challenges. Like we have highly capable technical force that can power through most of the technical challenges. So it becomes more of like, how do you organize for the scale other than your capability of solving a specific technical challenge? Um, well, you started. I have a first question here on the technical <laughs> aspect. <laughs> um, um, it may be the not important uh, or the, the, the critical path, I would say, for, right. for, for your work, but how you deal with interdependencies between applications? Because you are looking to the program level, right? So yeah. many applications. And likely there are some level of dependencies that you see. How you avoid the trap that I depend on A and A depend on B, and then like we are got stuck? Well, there's no way to avoid the trap, right? So it's, it's gonna be there, right? So um, if most large organizations have evolved um, um, and they likely use databases as an integration pattern. They, all, they, they likely have some other integration hub as an integration pattern as well. So, and, and that's why like you have to acknowledge all of those, you know? Um, so for data, there's, there's not an easy answer for data, right? Data is about engaging with the owners of the data. And there was even a question on the chat about this, like establishing what what do you call authoritative source of data? Establish what are the consumers consumers of data, right? Um, and then establish like what is the plan to migrate the centers of data, right? I think it was Gardner that coined it that the conversation has moving like to what's running in your data center to like what are your centers of data, which is like this very highly gravitational force around data where applications have to reside around. So there is no magic. It's just a lot of hard work and, and discipline and road mapping the move of those applications, the impact to those. Um, maybe to extend a little bit is there will always be some applications that can survive with data that is, let's say, a day uh, behind. And there is a strategy that I implement for those, which is different than the strategy for the applications that need uh, live data. Um, which is different for the strategy that you implement for analytical data. Um, so, um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so connecting some questions that we have in the chat as well, um, back into the champion uh, model that you mentioned. Uh, the first is, uh, are the cloud champions dedicated to this role? And what are the, the incentives that you bring to get them more engaged? Um, so first is they're not dedicated. And I think that's something that we take advantage of the fact they're not dedicated. So they are often application owners or let's say lead designs for application groups. Um, and that means that there has to be an investment from their supporting business group or supporting technology group so that they can dedicate part 
of that to this effort. Uh, but it is understood, like at, at, a, at the, let's say, the leadership level, it is understood that their own migration or scaling can't happen if it depends entirely on, on my team or, or us. So they also understand that they are using this and, and investing in this group of people. And it's not a lot, right? Um, we have like, we have thousands of developers, right? Can't say exactly between two and 10,000, let's put it this way. Uh, and the group of champions is like 60, 70 people uh, that have a good amount of visibility in that group. They're, they technically understand their own part of the technology. Um, so that they can be built to train their groups, you know, so that the initiatives that we run within the central, let's say, capacity at AWM, they can train and build their own, which will scale the overall adoption for that for that capacity. Right. I think the advantage of not having them fully dedicated is that they will continue to have a very good understanding of what is it that their technology group area is doing, the apps that are a priority for them. Um, and you keep connecting those apps and the need to those apps for new capabilities, for new techniques to the larger program so that we can, again, together with the other champions, advocate or build or create the ROI or create incentive uh, at a much larger scale. Awesome. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, now shift, gear, shift the gears a lot. One phrase that you mentioned that I think it's very eye open, and I hope that everyone has in the same page, the move to the cloud shouldn't be a cost play, but more a speedy play. I think that's yeah. a very important statement. But you also try, you mentioned track the dollars. Yeah. Um, and how long it takes that you've been seeing to have this bubble burst yeah bracket the the, the the cost is to more um expected value that that was initial ideas right um i think i think the it might vary per company right but in our case given um and there are some systems where this is this is let's say truer or this is more representative than others right um there are some systems that the ben the cost benefit is not there due to the potential risk, right? Yet those teams need to be incentivized to move, so there has to be some other advantage. Another advantage could be, hey, you'll be able to increase your ability to ship software twenty percent. Well, that's a lot, right? That means that like I can serve my customers better. Um, in terms of the bubble, uh, funny enough, that that was a term that my financial team created or made up. I don't know if they found it somewhere or if they just like, it's just a financial term, but I liked it, so I'm using it. Right? It is that you have to be very wise to acknowledge that you, for a large organization, you can't turn off at the same rate you turn on, right? You, you can't not continue to pay at the same way you are embracing new costs, right? So the point is, it needs to be strategic for the firm. When it needs, when it is strategic for the firm, that's seen as investment dollars, right? And not just as as like expense, right? So for the firm, it is strategic. Like Laurie Beer, the firm CIO, went to a major technology vendor conference and talked about like our cloud adoption program at scale, you know? Um, uh, at that scale, like the firm has, I think, if I quote correctly, like more than like 50, five zero trillion dollars of assets under custody, like that's money from people around. So tracking this bubble, we believe that in our case, it's probably gonna be like a two year journey where um, we, have, we have generally higher investments needed uh, until we can see more of the scale, shut down, turn off, decommission of the things that we are moving, right? More, some teams are more, uh, like as, as in the, the cycle, some teams are more prone to making that decision shut down, turn off earlier than others. You have to be cognizant of those and support them on that journey. Uh, a question that I saw in the chat, just to touch a little bit, uh, for Charlie on, on cost, is that from, let's say, moments zero, we brought a financial practice within my group. So there is a person in my group that looks at costs 
and technology costs by like a, as a function as most of what that person does is like where are we wasting money right and when going to public cloud it literally means throwing money away right because for on-prem workload you're employing people you might have bought real estate there's a lot of other things get getting to that math right so you're sustaining families you know you have uh, real estate that it becomes um, you can sell later or you can rent so it becomes an asset that you manage from that perspective but for public cloud it's waste I think waste is the best word so for the agilists there that love waste this is like an amazing thing that you should track is like how to reduce the waste there right so there is of course reducing waste from a thousand perspectives if you're uh, lean but that is one of them it's being um, intentional about tracking uh, correct image si correct instance sizing. It's being intentional about providing architectural guidance. Hey, you could go to a serverless architecture, not have a single service running, and this will make you like it will cost you like a thousand dollars less a month, right? And so, yeah, a thousand dollars less a month times twelve, it's not a lot, but times many, many, many applications. <laughs> It becomes a significant number. So you have to be intentional about those. And by intention, like it shouldn't be like a one-off thing that you are doing. So we have an active FinOps program in our group that engages the applications that are not at their optimal utilization level and gives them guidance on what to do immediately to reduce costs. It could be like, hey, I see that uh, you have an application here that's in a dev account. You might want to shut them down at night. You might want to shut them down in the evenings, right? Um, just as a matter of save money. So, um, and also for test environments, hey, I see that your test environment is maybe too large or not representative of what you should be. So could we maybe reduce your test environment? Hey, we see that you could implement some, some lifecycle policies to move data to a cheaper storage, you know? Um, so, um, I think that's the thing. It's like it's being intentional uh, about this to reduce that the size of the bubble, not to scare yeah. your, your, your 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 CFO, right? Um, yeah. And and connected to this, what's the role of multi-cloud? You mentioned hybrid cloud. You have more than one cloud provider. And yeah. what's the challenge of this? Is that you go 100% in just one? That may be easier double quotes. But it, what's the, the 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 landscape if you have hybrid cloud? There is, there's a few ways the ways and reason to understand this, right? One is that um, I think we all have to acknowledge that um, by design, you are always going to end up using or running applications in multiple places. Um, either you're consuming a SaaS software that you don't know where it's running, where you do know where it's running, right? Um, or maybe the nature of how geographically distributed your business is. So I can give you an example as I'm, we're having this conversation. So Amazon does not have a region in Switzerland. And for us in the private bank business, like having a region in Switzerland, it's important, right? So then we, but for those situations, we would have to resort to providers that have a footprint available in that region, right? Um, so there's many reasons that uh, we could take from a technical perspective. I'm a fan of trying to, um, provide some portability for the applications, right? So if you can deploy applications, they can be somewhat portable. And either you solve that on the runtime by let's say rely on Kubernetes, for example, as one way, not the silver bullet by any means, but like one way to somewhat standardize what runtime looks like. Or you can standardize on like CI CD pipelines that can package and ship for different environments. I probably like that better even. Um, so that is that is a few ways. And and even from a regulatory perspective, depends on the region you're running, the regulator might ask, you need to be running on multiple cloud providers by, by regulatory reason, you know. Um, okay. I have two more questions and I want to touch about uh, 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 even on the acceleration events, but um, if you can quickly answer two aspects. First is how important is the architecture framework that you, the applications adopt in this journey to the cloud and connecting, try to connect to this is, or what about the maintain CI CD for applications which doesn't have an active development? Right. Um, great two questions. So like, I'll address I'll address the second one first. Right. Um, mo most companies have an application um, 
let's say, maintenance policy, right? So my program focuses on applications that are in what we call, that we want to invest or maintain, and on applications that we want to, let's say, divest or stop using, right? So um, it is, it is, um, um, and then the, the applications with an active maintenance, like we, I think most of those are divest, right? For our case. So we rather just focus on the ones that are evolving and the ones that are becoming intrinsically important for the business, which is large majority. Um, um, and I missed your second question, Percelli. So, um, was that, well, yeah. well, I take the framework. So, got it. So, I, I, I mean, glad you asked. I didn't have time to put in the presentation, but we have created in our group what we call reference architectures and solution patterns, which is, um, as the name says, given a problem, what is the tested and proven solution for that? And, and we broke it down into like larger architectural references um, and to smaller consumable patterns, right? So for example, a large is you want to move an application that's going to become microservices, uh, that you want to run on a serverless architecture, uh, that's going to have a data pipeline, and that's going to have some specific backup policy, right? So that's like some of the reference architecture. But there are multiple patterns that, are f that fit into that. So the patterns for us are specific things. Like, for example, um, how do you observe Lambda? you know, uh, within the, 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 the constructs of what the firm has available for you to observe and what the provider has. So, so those individual patterns, they are also consumable independently. And we have those to like, for, for like uh, data pipelines, we have those for observability, we have those for backup and restore. So there is a, a decent and growing group of technology recommendations that we have tried, tested and blasted and maintained that folks can rely. Okay, I will just create a tease and hope to see you in the Hangouts. We are about to wrap up this, but what are the size of these acceleration events? How many human beings you put together in a room? Um, it's, it, it's, let's say, let's say 50 to 100 people. It's, it's a good number, right? So um, it, it varies, but it's 50 to 100 people. Um, we have had larger ones, like with like close to 100 people. But the key aspect of the acceleration event is, do you have all the support needed at an arm's length? Arm's length, like and like all. I mean all. Right? Um, okay. If, um, if we'll follow, this yeah. in the hangout. You you, yeah. you maybe uh, expand a little bit in the hangout that yeah. we we'll have you there because we are like wrap up right now. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much, Gio, again no for the questions and seeing the hangout. See you then.